So, um, the goal uh, for today is to just um, make a contribution uh, to an open source project here, in particular, Scikit-learn. So the idea is that together we work on um, fixing some of the issues, improving the code, improving the documentation, and so on. What we'd really like uh, long term is for you to engage with this or other projects, because um, our contributor base is a heavily skewed mail, and we'd really like to fix that. And so um, today is just sort of um, to help you get get into um, contributing, but really we would love for you to stay on and keep contributing in the future. And in particular, um, whatever you start today, maybe follow up on it uh, uh, next couple of days or next week, and ideally stay on board. Contributing to open source is really a great opportunity um, to create a portfolio of projects and also to get some mentorship. Uh, a lot of the people that start contributing to uh, Scikit-learn um, got uh, jobs or other opportunities that way. So I also want to talk through now uh, sort of the basic steps of contributing um, with a little bit of the technicalities of Git and GitHub. So the first thing you need to do is uh, set up a Python environment to work in. If you don't have any uh, set a working Python environment, install Anaconda, it's the easiest way to do it. If you uh, already have a working Python environment, you can either work within that, but uh, you probably want to install the um, scikit-learn development version, which we'll all be working on. And so it's probably not a good idea to use your working environment for this, and it's a good idea to create a separate virtual environment. And um, so here, if you use conda, you can do ubu conda create dash n, give the environment a name, for example, sklearn dev, and then uh, install, say, these packages, which is what you would need to build scikit-learn. And then search activate sklearn dev, activates this environment, and you can install scikit-learn in that environment. Personally, I have my, the development version of scikit-learn run in my main environment, but uh, maybe you don't want to do that. So next step is to first uh, fork scikit-learn on GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash scikit-learn slash scikit-learn, in the top right, uh, right there's a uh, button called fork. If you do that, you get your own basically personal copy of the scikit-learn um, repository in your GitHub account. So whenever you want to contribute via GitHub to any repository, this is basically the first step. Once you do that, you get uh, github.com slash your username slash scikit-learn. So here it's amular slash scikit-learn. This is my fork of the repository, my copy. Now I can check out that copy by uh, clicking on um, clone or download here. And um, you can either, if you have an SSH key on GitHub, you can use SSH. If you don't know how that works, just click use HTTPS. You get a URL here and do um, git clone and that URL. This will um, check out or well, clone the repository and so you'll have a local copy of the repository on your machine. That um, so this will be a local copy of your uh, repository that point. What you usually want to do at first step is also add what's called the upstream repository. So this is the, rep the main repository. Um, and people usually call this the upstream. So we do git remote add upstream and then the URL to the main repository. That's for the case that while we're working, other people will be working on this repository. And so if someone contributes to the repository, you want to get their new changes and want to build your changes on top of their changes. Um, and that's why we need this. So we, we can pull from there the current version of what we all collaborated on. Yeah? The slide. These slides. Okay. Um, I'm happy to help you afterwards. There's, oh, there's also the, I mean, so you can download the slides, so you can go through the slides more slowly. Um, I'm not sure if the slides have notes. That was not smart. Hmm? Yeah, there's the contribution guide. Um, it's a little bit less detailed. 
Uh, so if you go to one second. If you go to uh, scikit-learn documentation, uh, user guide, no, sorry, development and contributing. So I can also post this into Gitter. Um, this is the guide to uh, how to contribute. There we go. And also, all of us will be happy to help you with this process. Um, and I realize I'm going a bit quickly, but um, there's a lot of things going into this. And so I assume, so who here is familiar with working with GitHub? OK. Um, yeah, so I assume people are familiar with parts of this workflow. I don't want to go through everyone in, in great detail. Um, but if you have questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them uh, afterwards and ha happy to help you through. And now I killed my um, killed my presentation window and have to do everything again. Oh no, it works. That's amazing. Cool. Okay, so we now have our local copy. We have a fresh environment, and we can install now uh, Scikit-Learn in this fresh environment. So. We check out, uh, or we clone the repository. That means wherever we did that, um, we have a, a folder called scikit-learn now. You can go into this folder, uh, pip install-e dot. We'll install the package from that folder. Dash e stands for editable, which means you can make changes in this folder directly, and they will be reflected in your installation. Uh, in other words, what, what this does is basically just adds the current directory to your Python path. So whatever changes you make there, if you import sklearn, you'll get that version. Um, so this will override existing installations. So if you uh, already have uh, scikit-learn installed by Iconda before that, that's a really bad idea. If you have it installed it by a pip before that, it'll just override it. So that's why I recommend, um, if you already have an environment with scikit-learn in, in there that you're using, create a new environment just for doing the development. So it's better to override your older version? No, it's not, it's not better to override. It's better to make a fresh environment. So with the Conda Create, uh, you can create a different environment and use that just for developing uh, scikit-learn. Will you have two versions? Yeah, so then you have two versions and you can decide with this Basically, with source activate, you change into the environment, and then you using the you can use uh, the development version. And um, so this is so as not to mess with your uh, usual working environment. Like if you use uh, uh, any of this stuff in your job, you don't want to break the stuff that you're using on your job. So you have a separate environment that you use just for development. Are we planning on breaking a lot of things? Um, yes, we're planning on breaking everything. So the next thing is um, finding something to work on. So now we installed scikit-learn. You can also, um, if you just do, I don't have this here, um, but it's also in the develop, sorry, in the contributor guide. If you call pytest sklearn or just pytest in this folder, you can run all the tests and uh, they should all pass on your machine. Pytest. Pytest or pytest sklearn. Just all right, so then th after you install the development version, the next thing is finding something to work on. So um, we, meaning Thomas, already curated um, a list of uh, items to work on in this uh, Women Machine Learning GitHub org. So there's this uh, URL that you can click or um, you can go to projects on the GitHub um, repository for the sprint today. And there is a list of issues. I really recommend um, picking something very, very simple for your first issue, because it's mostly to get you to know, uh, uh, get you used to the workflow, 
and communicating with the project. So even if it's just something simple like typos or improving the documentation in a little way, um, it's good to get started to pick something very, very simple. I'm pretty sure my first contribution to scikit-learn was like fixing a typo in documentation. Um, I'll talk a little bit more later about how to pick an issue. But basically you just say, okay, I'm working on this um, in the issue. Maybe you can also just say, I'm working on this as part of the Women Machine Learning Sprint in New York. And so before you start working, make sure you have the, cur the, um, the current version of the upstream uh, master, so the current version of the de uh, uh, development version by getting, doing git pull upstream master. Um, if you want to take uh, over someone else's pull request that someone worked on in the past, uh, there's also a command to do that here. That's probably not what you're going to do. If you just start a new contribution, do um, git checkout dash b branch, and then you give it a branch name, say whatever you want to implement, say like fixing the docs or anything like that. Um, this will give you a git feature branch in which you will um, make your changes, you commit your changes, ideally you run PyTest then, you uh, run flake 8 which is like um, a style checker, and um, then you do, uh, do I have to git commit? Okay. Then you push the changes to your fork, which is which you do with git push origin and then the name of your branch. Once you do that, you can go on the scikit-learn um, project website, uh, sorry, GitHub website, github.com slash scikit-learn slash scikit-learn, and this thing's gonna show up. Uh, this green box saying compare and pull request. You can click on that, and it shows you an interface for creating a pull request. This is to actually merge your changes from uh, your fork, which is your copy of scikit-learn on GitHub, to the main copy of scikit-learn on GitHub. And so um, you should give it a title that actually says what you're going to do. Um, so we sometimes use this WIP or MRG for things that are work in progress, so something you just started. Uh, but you don't think is ready for review and MRG for things that you think are ready for others to review and merge. If you, um, for a title, it probably shouldn't say fixes issue number so and so because there's 10,000 issues and we're, I'm really bad at memorizing these numbers. Um, so the title should be something that actually describes what you're doing. But then in the body of the description, you should say fixes issue number so and so, because then Google, then GitHub will link these issues together, and if you use words like fixes and then the number, then if once this is uh, merged, it will actually close the issue automatically. So make sure the title is basically human readable, make the description something descriptive, but then in the description also say which issue you're addressing. If you change anything in the code, it's, there's a 99% chance you need to add a test. So whenever you add any functionality or fix any bug or do anything, you need to write a test that the thing that you did actually does what you said it does. So these are usually called regression tests. And um, unless you just change documentation and there's no regression test, for anything else, you need to add a regression test. Uh, which is like you go to the te test files, or if you have if you have questions about how to write your regression tests, we're happy to help. But it's very unlikely that your contribution will be complete if there is no new test added. And then make sure continuous integration passes. So at once you create this pull request, uh, maybe just let me show you an example of this. Maybe I should never use this. 
So once you create a pull request, it'll look like this. And then at the bottom, you'll have all um, these continuous integration. These are services that run in the cloud and basically um, download your code and run all kinds of tests on them. And so you need to make sure that all of them are green. If, not, if some of them are not green, let's see, like Nicholas, yours is red. So these are always at the very bottom. Oh well, these, these actually don't bring me anything. So let, let me see. Uh, Does this have meaningful failing tests? Yes. So here you can see there's lots of red axes. And so if you click on details, uh, then you'll see something that might be helpful or not. If it's not helpful here in this case, it's not really helpful. You can do a few more details on Azure pipelines. And then you click through this beautiful Azure uh, thing and after five clicks, you can see what, maybe five clicks and a lot of scrolling, you can see what the actual issue is. It's maybe not, so, this test is failing. So it's, it's like, you, you, as you saw, it takes me a couple of clicks to get there, but if I click on the red X um, enough times, I'll get from the pull request to the thing that's actually failing. And so by the, probably something will fail once you push. So this is like the default is you fail something, uh, so everything fails and then you fix it. And then in the end everything is green and then someone will come and review your changes. So once everything is green, you're basically waiting for reviews. Um, so uh, the, the devs here in the room will try to review. We have other people that um, I try to review. I think it's early in the morning, so Paris is still awake. So hopefully some of these folks will uh, review stuff. Um, and there will always, so it's very unlikely that there's not gonna be no comments. So uh, don't feel bad if people ask for changes. People will always ask for changes. Um, address the reviews in the same branch, so just make changes and uh, commit to the same branch. Uh, if you push to your fork, it will update the pull request automatically. Um, so then once the reviewers are satisfied, they will um, probably just approve the PR in the GitHub interface. There's a thing that says someone approved your pull request and they will get yeah, like a green check mark. And once two people approved, uh, approved it, it can be merged. So uh, our policy is two core developers need to approve any pull request to be merged, unless it's something like very, very simple, like a typo in the docs might just get merged automatically or directed by one uh, contributor. But yeah, so waiting for reviews, you um, you probably want to like start working on something else while you wait for reviews because it might take it a while uh, for someone of us to get around to checking your code. But also, I wouldn't recommend working on like five things at once because um, I sometimes see people like start the first thing, send a pull request instead of the second thing, the third thing, the fourth thing, and um, but all of these will require more work. There will be comments on all of them. So maybe if you have two open pull requests, you'll be uh, busy. Um, if you have five, you're probably not gonna finish any of them. So as I said before, we have this, uh, this curated list already of things that you can work on, but you can also just go through the issue tracker. The issue tracker has these tags, need contributor, easy, oh, good first issue, that's not on the list here, and sprint, um, so I would particularly look for the good first issue ones or the neat contributor ones. 
A thing that you can also do that helps us a lot is find your own issues or even just open issues. If there's a bug that you found ever, if there's something in documentation that you find really unclear, there's any behavior that you find is like really weird, open an issue and tell us. This is now, is a, it's uh, opening bug reports is a very valuable contribution. Yes, you can open an issue and then fix it later. I recommend you, op uh, you open an issue first. So you, can you, you could have a pull request without an issue, but often it's um, not entirely clear what is the best way to fix an issue. So I would open the issue first, so you can discuss with the developers what's the best way to go forward, and then we can fix it. Um, but yeah, it's, so, Input from our users is really, really important. That's what helps us make, give a, um, create good documentation and make the project um, be nice and usable is that it's all of your feedback. So even if you just open issues, that's a very valuable contribution. It's a very good use of your time to open issues of what you hate about scikit-learn. Well, unless we can't fix it. Um, so there's also there's a bunch of issues that are already open. So maybe before you open an issue, you can see if someone else opened the issue beforehand. Some of the things that I hate about scikit-learn are very hard to fix. Okay, another thing is there's also you can also look at pull requests. Um, so you can find stalled pull requests where the authors don't address um, review comments for like a month or more. We have pull requests from. Um, I think right now the oldest ones are like 2014 um, that the contributor abandoned, but they might still be interesting. So you can um, pick them up if you want. And uh, to minimize the number of future stalled pull requests, please follow up on the work that you're starting today. You can also uh, review uh, pull requests you can review pull requests that are up there already, or you can review pull requests that um, other people here make. So maybe you send your first pull request, and then you check out what is all the work that the other people in the room did, and you can uh, comment on their um, work, and you can see if they made maybe some mistakes you can spot. Reviewing is also a very good way to um, improve your coding skills and improve, improve your understanding of the project. So you can see, oh, this person address, tries to address this issue, this is how they went about it, and either you can learn from what they did, or maybe you can teach them something about how to do it better. All right, yeah. And um, also on pull requests, Okay, both for issues and for pull requests that you might be reviewing, don't be afraid to ask clarifying questions. Victor, if I open an issue, it's probably very unclear because often I write issues that are more or less notes to myself so I understand what a problem is, um, which is very bad style because it makes it very hard for you to figure out what the problem is. So if there's an issue open and that's maybe even uh, linked on the project board, but it's not clear to you what the issue is, Please ask clarifying questions and we'll be happy to clarify what, what the issue is and how to fix it. Yeah, and again, I want to emphasize, um, pick something as simple and trivial as possible to get started. Um, doing a major feature is probably not something you can do in a day. I would start really with something very, very simple that you're very confident and then go from there. Because there's like a lot of steps, as you saw. I went through this very quickly. There's a lot of steps you have to do. And so just getting everything set up the right way is already um, quite some effort. And once you have your first simple contribution done, then you can move up to, uh, move up to more interesting stuff. Yeah, and you definitely, I think it's a good way to, good idea to start with the things that we tagged in the project, but there might be interesting issues in the, pull, in the issue tracker and the pull requests that are not uh, appropriately tagged or that are not on the project board. And so you can always like go around there um, and check. It can be a little bit overwhelming 
because we have about 600 open issues and uh, about 1,400 open, sorry, 600 open pull requests and about uh, 1,400 open issues, I think. So I like browsing through them, but it can be a bit overwhelming, I think. Cool. So thank you all for your help today. I hope you have uh, a great day and learn a lot. And um, I'm happy to take any questions now or, uh, or later. And I'm happy to help you with uh, any steps on the, uh, in this process. Okay. Questions so far? Okay, let me repeat the question. So the question was, um, how do you know if someone's still working on, a, some, on something that someone already started? So there's a pull request where someone already started on an issue. I think so. the usual measure is just time. And so if they did something and then the reviewers provided some comments and then they com didn't come back for a month or for six months, then we assume they abandoned it and they're not gonna fix it. And then you can take it over. And it might be that whatever they did didn't help at all. It might be that they fixed everything except for like a small word in the documentation. Or if there's often changes, we want to have a change in the change log, which is called the what's new. It might be everything is done except for the change log entry. So you really, really need to read and see how far did they come. Um, and is what they did the right fix? Um, but sort of, the question of um, am I taking over someone's work where they already um, they're they're still working on? It's basically just time. Like if they didn't work on it for a couple of weeks, they're probably not going to come back. And they, basically, I think the the understanding is they should if they didn't answer for a couple of weeks, they shouldn't complain if someone else uh, takes over their work. A good question. I, I mean, I, I opened it, so um, I think it's still sort of open for discussion. I went through the whole issue tracker and no, sorry, through all the pull requests, and I tried to tag things. Um, but uh, you can definitely hot uh, tag things better, um, but it might be tricky because it might not be clear why something has stopped. It's like if there's like if there's a discussion of like a hundred messages. And then, like a year ago, people stopped replying. It might be not entirely obvious why it didn't go forward. I'm and just wondering if you can go by the tags. Oh yeah, you, you, I should. I think you can go by the tags, but you shouldn't. Like they're like eighty percent accurate. <laughs> So that's probably an issue and a pull request, right? So the first one is the issue, and the second one is a code contribution that att maybe attempts to fix that. And so if that's stalled, then you can do. So then you can see like, it, is it worth um, working on top of this code? And you can use this line to get their code, and then change make changes on top of their code. Or maybe if the code is from uh, 2015, maybe there's no point in trying to get their code and maybe you need to start from scratch. But usually the, the, the idea would be get their code and work from there, if it seems like a reasonable approach. Um, talk to me. If you're unsure about whether you want to open an issue, talk to uh, one of the SKLearn developers. That's probably the easiest way to get direct feedback. All right, there's no more direct questions now. We can finally all get our bagels and coffee maybe, and then get started. Um, maybe I'll try to upload this 
video so you can go through it again um, but otherwise just feel free to ask me or anyone else if you have questions and get stuck